Back during the Vietnam War, my family and I lived close to a plain field. It wasn't the actual airport in Long Chung, but there were many villages nearby. The plane had one grim purpose. It was used to transport dead Hmong soldiers back to their villages. At the time, I was only 13 years old. Every time one or two helicopters came to the field, I would go with my mom. Many people would gather, hoping their father or brother wasn't returning in a body bag. My dad and two older brothers were at war, helping the American soldiers. Whenever they were home, we ignored the sound of the helicopters. We only went to the field when my dad and brothers were off to war, praying they wouldn't come back in a body bag. Not everyone who died in the war came home. Many were lost forever in the jungle. One day, my dad and brothers weren't home. When we heard the helicopter, my mom and I went to the field again. On the way, my mom told me that she had a very bad dream the night before. My mom never handed my two-year-old sister Sheng to me. But that day, when we arrived at the field, she gave Sheng to me. As they started unloading the bodies from the helicopter, I saw my mom kneel down and begin to cry in front of a body bag. It was my 15-year-old brother. He had died during a mission to rescue American pilots who were shot down in enemy territory. My mom told me that the night before, she had dreamed of my brother. He came home, sat at the fireplace, and told her he was cold. When she looked at him, he was bleeding heavily from the side of his head and asked her to apply herbal medicines to his wound. We Hmong always pay close attention to our dreams. Sometimes they are just dreams, but other times they warn us of things to come. After the Americans fled Southeast Asia, some Hmong men returned home. My dad and some men from our village came back, but we didn't know where my 17-year-old brother was. We hadn't heard whether he was dead or alive. By then, I was already 14 years old, and the communist soldiers kept coming to our village. One day, they came and took my dad and some other men away. We didn't know what had happened to them. We waited, hoping my dad would return, but he never did. Almost every week, the communist soldiers came back to see if any more Hmong men had returned from the war. Some Hmong men were scared and hid in the jungle or on farms, refusing to come back to the village. The communist soldiers eventually started staying in our village, and some Hmong families, frightened, began to leave. They pretended they were going to their farms, but never returned. One morning, just before the chickens crowed, I woke up to yelling and arguing in the village. Our house was on the edge of the village and the noise was coming from the center. Then I heard gunshots and people screaming. My sister, Sheng, started crying, so I woke my mom. She had been very sick since my dad was taken away. My mom told me to quickly pack some rice. The gunshots were still a bit far away, so I packed some rice and sweet potatoes and grabbed a strip of cloth that had two silver bars in it. I tied it around my waist like a belt. We left our home and ran into the jungle while it was still dark. As we fled, I looked back and saw two houses on fire. The gunshots continued. After walking through the jungle for a while, my mom said she couldn't go on. She said her heart was pounding, and she started vomiting, so we rested in the jungle. When the sun rose, we heard footsteps coming our way. It was some Hmong villagers. They told us we had to leave because everyone in the village was already dead. The soldiers had killed many villagers and burned down some houses. We had to leave before the soldiers caught up to us. My mom couldn't continue, so she told me to take Sheng and go with the villagers. One of the women asked my mom if she was pregnant, and my mom said she was four months along. The woman told her to catch up when she felt better. I didn't want to leave, but my mom insisted, saying that Sheng and I wouldn't survive on our own. I took Sheng and left with the villagers. There were at least eight of us, two men, a grandmother, and three women. As we left, Sheng began crying. The villagers feared her cries would alert the soldiers, 
so they told me to cover her mouth when she cried. After a while, we found a spot deep in the jungle and decided to rest. Soon after, we heard distant gunshots from the direction we came from. My heart sank, and I prayed that my mom was still alive. The group decided we needed to move again. We started walking deeper into the jungle and walked all day until it began to get dark. We stopped at a spot and built a small shelter with sticks and banana leaves. The two men said we could only build a fire inside one of the huts to avoid being seen as it got darker. We built a fire to cook some corn and potatoes before the sun went down. Once it was dark, we put the fire out. Sheng kept crying, so one of the men mixed a little bit of opium in water and told me to give it to her. He said it would only make her sleepy. I tried to give it to her, but she wouldn't drink it. The man took the opium water from me and forced it into Sheng's mouth. About ten minutes later, Sheng was asleep. That night, we slept in the jungle. I couldn't sleep because bugs were crawling around, and I was scared and worried about my mother. Around midnight, I heard voices, like people talking in the distance. It sounded like they were speaking our language, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. It went on for a little while, and then everything became quiet again. The two men from our group got up, grabbed their weapons, and went to investigate. After a while, they came back and lay down. I guess they didn't find anything. I heard one of them say that maybe the voices were from the spirits of the forest. In the morning, before sunrise, they woke everyone up. I turned to look at Sheng. Her face was bluish white. I rubbed her chest, but she wasn't responding. I sat up and started rubbing her harder, but there was no response. I began to cry. One of the men told me to stop because we had to go. Seeing how upset I was, he offered to help dig a small hole for her. He started digging with a stick in his hands. After we made a shallow hole, he placed my sister inside, covered her with two banana leaves, and then some dirt. Then we left. As we walked away, I kept looking back, hoping the dirt would move, and that maybe she was just sleeping and would wake up. But as we walked farther and farther away, I started hearing my sister calling me. I told them I heard her calling and that I wanted to go back, but they wouldn't let me. It was just my imaginations. We stayed in the jungle for what felt like days. The two men with us had guns but wouldn't use them to hunt animals because they didn't want to alert the communist soldiers. Even if we killed an animal, we couldn't roast it, as the smell could give us away. We could only boil it if we found water. As we started running out of food, we began eating tree roots and the centers of banana tree trunks. We continued through the jungle until we stumbled upon some farms. We realized we must be near a Hmong village. As we walked closer, we saw bodies along the trail. Seeing the dead bodies, we decided not to go to that village. We didn't know if the communist soldiers were still there. We kept moving deeper into the jungle. The sun was setting when we heard someone say, Are you guys Hmong? We looked ahead and saw at least six Hmong men hiding behind trees, pointing their weapons at us. We told them we were Hmong. They asked if we had any weapons, and the two men in our group said they each had one. They told them to drop the weapons, which they did, and a young man came to pick them up. They asked where we were from, and we explained the situation at our village. They also asked if communist soldiers were following us, and we said no. They invited us to join their group, which was stationed ahead. Two of the men led us to meet the others in hiding. There were about 20 people in their group, and now we were almost 30. They already had some huts built in the area. That night we ate. Afterward, the men went on guard duty, telling us that if we ever heard them fighting or heard gunshots, we should run and they would catch up. We stayed there for a few days before moving again. Some people in the group knew how to find the Mekong River. Our goal was to cross it and reach Thailand. In this group, there was a 16-year-old girl named Pala. 
She was carrying her seven-month-old baby girl on her back. Her husband had been killed in their village. Her baby cried sometimes, but she had some opium mixed with water, which she gave her baby to make her sleepy. One morning, probably around 4 a.m., we heard gunshots from where the men were on guard duty. Pala's baby started crying. Everyone panicked. We remembered that the men had told us to run if we heard gunshots, and they would catch up later. It was still dark, so Pala gave her baby the opium and strapped her to her back. We started running through the jungle in darkness. After about five minutes, the gunshot stopped, but we kept running. When the sun rose, we realized that only nine of us remained. We had lost some members in the dark jungle. We stopped to rest, hoping the guards would catch up. Paula took her baby down to breastfeed, but discovered that her baby was dead. She must have given her too much opium that morning in the dark. She started sobbing uncontrollably. The group urged her to stop, fearing the soldiers would hear. She sat holding her baby, tears streaming down her face. Just then, we heard more gunshots in the distance. We didn't know if there was more fighting or if the communist soldiers had found some of our group members. We needed to keep moving, but Paula wouldn't stand up. She had lost her husband and now her daughter. I tried to convince her to get up, but she refused. The rest of the group started leaving, and I too left her behind. After walking for a bit, I decided to go back for her. The others told me not to, saying they wouldn't wait for me, but I insisted I would catch up. I ran back and found Pala still crying, looking up at the heaven. I told her we needed to go, or we would lose the group. I broke off a tree branch, covered her baby girl with leaves, and we left to search for the others. We walked all day but couldn't find them. As it got dark, we decided to build a little hut and rest for the night. In the early morning, when there was enough light, I got up to relieve myself. While I was peeing, I looked to my right and saw a small blue leg sticking out from under a branch of leaves. That's when I realized that we had been walking in circles. That little leg was Paula's baby girl. I didn't tell Paula because I didn't want her to cry again. I woke her up and we started walking again. By noon, we found ourselves at the same spot. This time, we both saw the blue leg and ants were now covering her baby girl. Paula began to cry. I told her I would dig a hole to bury her daughter. I dug a small hole, placed her baby inside, and covered her with dirt and leaves. Then we continued walking through the jungle. I don't know how many days had passed. I didn't even know if we were headed in the right direction toward the Mekong River. One night, we came across a big fallen tree and slept under it. In the early morning, we heard people talking in Hmong. I looked and saw a group of seven Hmong people, two women, three children, and two men. I was so happy to see them. I asked where they were going because Pala and I were lost. After talking for a bit, we joined their group. The leader said we were close to the Mekong River. At sunset that day, we finally reached the river. It was huge and terrifying but it was also a sign of hope. We began chopping down banana trees and bamboo to tie them together as a raft. The women and children sat on the raft while I stood on one side, another man on the other, and our leader at the back. We started paddling as darkness fell. When we reached the other side, we rested on the river bank, not knowing if we had made it to Thailand or if we were still in Laos. We kept the raft just in case. The next morning we were woken up by Thai guards. They took us to the refugee camp, Ban Vinai. Once there, they placed us in a building and announced to the Hmong people in the camp that new arrivals had come. That's when my older brother came to check and he saw me. I didn't know he had already made it to Thailand. I told him what had happened to our family and village. While running through the jungle, I had fallen in love with Pala. I married her shortly after, and we had three children together in Ban Vinai. There are countless stories like this one in our community. 
Countless people had lost their family and loved ones while running through the dense jungle of Laos and crossing the Mekong River to Thailand. Thank you all for listening to my story. <laughs>